fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five zero AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mister Joe Goldberg is here. It's Thriller Day. Thriller Day. Fresh out of the dentist chair. Well, listen, I see, and I see this here, like this uh, article I sent you. You see that uh, that guy that after he talked to AI chat box, kills himself? That's right. He he, he went, uh, like the movie, he became addicted to AI female and uh, just became black, you know, brainwashed. What? I think we'll probably have to ask, ask Mark about this. This is the new question about uh about what about new writing techniques? Yeah, but yeah, it's scary. Yeah. It just it's, freaked it's, me out. I was like, uh, "Wow!" Uh, I mean, because I guess he asked the question he, to to the AI that would the world be a better place without him? And the AI, of course, is like, "Yeah, the world would be much better without humans because you know we're killing the planet type thing and that kind of thing." So he went and offed himself. He took it personally. Yeah, yeah. I was just listening to the guy from Google. He was saying he left because. Uh, he now is in total fear of of uh, AI taking over. He thought it'd be thirty to fifty years down the road. Says now it's just a few years. Well, where's he going? He's, I mean, he's the guy who started it. So move, move to Canada. Listen up, everybody. Go to your bunker. Yeah. <laughs> Grab your Mark Cameron books and head to the bunker there in Alaska. Go. Yeah, but, yeah. Joey, go go to Alaska. Yeah, don't come up there. Well, Mister Mark Cameron, you've got a new book out, and we're here to talk about it. It's called Breakneck. Whose neck did you break? <laughs> Thanks for having me on. No, hopefully, hopefully, Breakneck has to do more with the speed of the book than it does. Um, you know, that's a that's that's always a little bit of a a risk naming a, a book something like that because reviewers may come back and say, "Yeah, that I broke my neck trying to stop reading this book or whatever." But the the the, the point of it is the the speed of the book, and that's what the, how how fast things happen and how fast Arliss and Lola have to deal with things. As time goes by, are you finding yourself getting more concerned or more conscious of how you're writing these kinds of books? Because there's a lot of violence and action and insensitivity in the world and all that. Are you, is it sort of, is it making you go a different direction now or are you still kind of doing what you do? No, there's plenty of people that want a, a good action story and, and my books are not, I mean, they're, they're, uh, my, my mother-in-law has passed away now, but she said they were lurid, <laughs> but, uh, but she read them. Um, and interestingly enough, I'm noticing on this, we're in on book tour from starting in Spokane and working across Idaho and Wyoming. And then we'll start down or Montana and then down through Wyoming now and, uh, Colorado. But I've noticed that, that easily 60, 70% of the people that come to the events are, are women over 50 years old. And maybe that's a function of who's reading books. But it doesn't seem to, the violence and the mystery doesn't seem to be bothering them. So, you know, I think there's, um, plus I, I try to, I live the kind of life as, you know, I think Joe led this kind of life as well, but I've lived the kind of life where I've, I've seen the dark side of humanity and I actually kind of pull back from that. I, I have had plenty of that in it. I mean, my, my publisher calls these Alaska noir books and I think that's a fitting description, but at the same time, it's way worse. Life <laughs> violence is way worse than I write it on the page. Does that does that sort of taint you somewhat? Because you were you were in uh, law enforcement for quite a few years, and uh, did it sort of I don't know how angle you to sort of look at people for what they do wrong? No, no doubt, no doubt. I think it takes you. You have to. You know, both both of my sons have served in law enforcement. My eldest was an Air Force OSI agent for a number of years. It's the same job that. My first thriller character, Jericho Quinn, had or has, but um, so he, you know, he dealt with basically OSI for people that don't know. That's the same thing for the Air Force that NCIS is for the the Navy. Um, so he dealt with things that he was not really used to. And then our youngest is Anchorage, Alaska, police officer and a SWAT officer, and so 
and, and our youngest is actually a really just a sweetheart of a guy. And I, and I watched him have to become a bit more cynical. And But, you know, they grew up with me as a dad and hearing the stories around the dinner table. And, um, in fact, my, my, <laughs> my youngest son, when he was just off of FTO, or on FTO, so out of the training academy, but on field training, so he had a senior officer following around with a, you know, a microscope watching everything they do. And he called me kind of upset about two days into field training and said, Dad, how come you never told me that guts look like bubble gum? <laughs> and I said, well, not something Mom let me talk about at the dinner table. But it, it sort of shocked him, you know. And um, so, I, you know, I did hold back from them as they were growing up. But they also learned that, you know, there is evil out there, and there, and but not everybody is, and you have to be aware of it. I, I think the biggest thing I've learned and the people that – and the what I try to put across in the books is you just have to be realistic. You have to look at things as they are, not the way you wish they were to stay alive. And sometimes that comes across as very cynical. Well, that was kind of my question is how do you balance, if you have to read Mark's books, but how do you balance the realism with the fiction and then think about the reader as you're doing that? Are there things that you just say, no, or they need to know this. I need to write this in a fictional way. Yes and no. My my father had glaucoma, and so for the last 10 years of his life, he couldn't, he was blind, he couldn't read, but he loved books, and of course he wanted to read my books. And so my sweet mother would read everything I wrote out loud to him. And so I would, I did a lot of backspacing. I would write something out and think, oh my gosh, she can't, you know, she can't read that out loud. But at the same time, my mom read to me when I was young. She read me Roots when I was 11. Uh, whenever it came out, um, she read me all kinds of books that had, you know, that were rough, that were real. Uh, so I really wasn't worried about her reading the, the violence. There was just certain words that I didn't want her to, I couldn't imagine her saying. So I just said them a different way. But I, I think about my audience, certainly. But I, what I try to do it, when I'm writing, and what I hope comes across, is I, I envision these characters. I know what they're like. I know how they would act. Then I think of the, you know, the adventure, the mystery, whatever. And then I plunk those characters down in that situation and then allow them to, to be the way that they would be true to themselves. So if, 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 uh, Arliss, for instance, would respond in a particularly violent way because of his past, always, always within the law, but certainly brutally, then I allow him to do that and Lola the same way. And the, and the same with my other books with Jericho Quinn or Jacques Thibodeau and the other books. They're going to, they're not always going to seem, you know, not always going to be within the bounds of, of the law. They're sort of an extra ju- judicial kind of a little over the top kind of a thriller. And it's the same way with the, with writing the books for the Tom Clancy estate. I have to make sure that those characters respond the way that Tom Clancy envisioned them. I can't, mimic Tom Clancy, but I can make sure that his characters stay true, at least to the best of my ability, what he, to the best I can figure out how he envisioned them. So, you know, I, I, again, I just try to see things as they are and how a real law enforcement, how a real deputy marshal would react with the given background that I've given these people, how the real bad guy or woman would react uh, given their backgrounds and and just be true. I, I write a lot about native populations and many of my friends, are, I do a lot of work out in Western Alaska and Northern Alaska and we call it Bush Alaska, basically a place with no roads. You got to fly into it or take a boat. And because I write about Yupik, you know, indigenous people and Yupiat indigenous people, they, they incidentally Alaska and Yupik or in Yupiat call themselves Eskimos in Canada. That might be a derisive term or derogatory term. But and, and then Athabascans in the in the middle of Alaska or Clinkett down in southeast Alaska. So when I write about these people, because I am not indigenous, I do a lot of questioning and quizzing them. And you know, some of the things are pretty dark that uh, that uh, are being written about. And I give it to my my friends and say, "What do you think about this?" And and to a person, they all say, "Just tell the truth. You're going to make some people mad and some people happy." Just tell the truth. So that's what I try to do. Well, that's actually an excellent lead into a question that I always ask people who are like masters of the series for people who don't need Mark. And there's Jericho Quinn and the Cutler and the, and the Tom Clancy slash Jack Ryan series. And since I try to write series too, I want to get some advice. Do you start, as you just referred to, to the characters' behavior and what they do as you're writing a series for the next book? Or do you have the storyline planned out and you put the character in it? Or does the storyline change the character, and that's what you want the character to do in that next book? 
Yeah, I think it's different every time. I, it, I, I generally think of the, I have the characters in mind, you know, from the beginning, but then of course they grow and, you know, and it's different when, when I'm writing a, a Jack Ryan book, there's really not a big story. There's not a big character arc with Jack Ryan. He's, he is who he is. It, it, the same with the Bond, you know, the, there, he is James Bond. Uh, and so I don't, I have secondary characters that I can introduce or some of the campus members that I can introduce that I can grow over time, depending on the, you know, if one of them gets pregnant or, you know, or they get in a particular fight and they're afraid, you know, some of the things that what I try to add to these books being in law enforcement or kind of a, my, my son called me a former action guy being, you know, having lived that kind of life in Thrillers, Hollywood or on paper, very rarely do you see somebody worried that a knee injury is going to keep them out of their job for the rest of their life. You know, you could be the greatest action hero of all time and you get a wild kick from some teenager that's never fought anybody else but you and it screws up your knee and then you're all of a sudden driving a desk for the rest of your career. And so I want my characters to be thinking about that. So there's real risk besides just getting shot. There's there's just the risk of the and the risk of in the cutter books for instance there's a the risk of just the the psychological trauma of going through some of the things that they and and I don't want to I don't want to make it tropey where it's just you know some guy that's drowning his sorrows in a drink and and you know PTSD and all that I'm not I'm not downplaying that that's a real thing I just don't want to do some other people have done it very well. I just want to do something different. And so Cutter's got some real issues that, uh, that he's, that he's working his way through besides just the bad guys he's facing, you know, all the time. For instance, Jericho Quinn is still in love with his wife, his ex-wife. She's divorced him because she doesn't like that kind of life and he just pines away for her. But he's also got a girlfriend that he likes and, you know, he's never, she's never going to take him back. So I have readers that are like Team Kim or Team Ronnie and they want him to get back to his wife and other ones like Ronnie Garcia better. So, and that's cool. That's real life, right? That's what I try to be is true. Do you, do you find yourself um, using a lot of your own experience in some of these characters? Yeah, I do. I, I, I certainly don't base any of them on me. They're way cooler than I am. My, um, Kids would say. I listen to my son's talk. I listen to my daughter and her husband talk. My daughter rides, both of them ride motorcycles. I ride motorcycles. My youngest rides motorcycles. You know, I, so I put little pieces. I would say that I'm inspired by things that I've done and incident, mostly people I've met more than basing them on anything. There's a couple of, there's Stone Cross, the, the second Arliss Cutter book has a, a couple of altercations, a couple of fights that are pretty much blow for blow altercations that I've been in. So I was able to, you know, look back on those. I was so fortunate to to work with so many amazing people over the years and then also meet some pretty rotten people over the years. People ask me all the time if I, you know, they'll say like, you must really know a lot of evil people. I, I really don't. I've, I've met some evil people. I've met a lot of people that have done evil things, but the people that I would really devour your soul kind of even, they would just love to see you ruined. I could probably count on all my digits, you know, they're just, they're, they're there. They're certainly there. And those are the ones that I focus on when I write villains because I want my, my super good tracker, OSI agents, deputy marshals, whatever, to have a good a good, uh, you want them to well. kill them. <laughs> well, and ask the Al question. You see, well, if, how do you deal with the bad, bad characters yourself? I mean, do they change you? Do they impact you? Oh, yeah. I think, you know, what did Robert Frost say? No tears in the writer, no tears in the reader. If I'm not, if I don't have a bit of a chill, I, I wrote a scene today where one of the, the female bad, uh, baddies in the, probably the big bad in the, the newest Clancy that I'm finishing up with my, it'll be my last Tom Clancy that I do. I'm, kind of step away but uh i was writing a thing today well a scene today when my wife my wife drives to these cities for the book tour and i sit in the passenger seat and write and, and i got you know i thought oh wow this is working she is an evil woman um i need to feel that i need to see yeah this is they're really over the top bad at the same time i want them to be grounded in reality and and have not just all bad i want them to have you know interests and loves and hates and you know desires and all that besides just the you know the blow filled with the cat only thing we ever see kind of do, do you have a problem 
Or oh, many. I, I have many, problems. many, many, many. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about your right. problems here. No, I, I mean, when you go to a, a Jack Ryan or, you know, Tom Clancy and stuff, d- does it feel the same as when you're doing, you know, an artist book? Like, is, is it, what's the big differences there? Um, well, writing someone else's characters are, is a, when I say chore, it mounts, makes it sound bad. And I don't mean it that way because these are, what I should say is just a heavy responsibility. Um, you know, these characters, I, I kind of grew up with them in law enforcement. I was in the police academy when The Hunt for Red October came out in 1984. And so over the years of my kind of growing up in law enforcement with the police department in Texas and then with the United States Marshals and starting in 1991, I, um, I can tell you, okay, when, when some of all fears came out, I was on this assignment. When Rainbow Six came out, I was on this assignment. So when I got the call from my agent that they, because this is not something that you really aspire to. They call you out of the blue and say, would you like to write these? And so it was a, a big shock to my system that Mark Graney had recommended me. And when he stepped away, and I told Tom Colgan, the, the editor, that, man, I, I, I just can't do this. There's no way. I cannot write like Tom Clancy. And he said, well, don't. Don't try to write like Tom Clancy. Write a Mark Cameron book in the spirit of Tom Clancy. So he kind of talked me off the ledge a little bit. Even so... Writing John Clark, who's always been, he's a kind of a universal favorite of people that like Jack Ryan novels. So writing about John Clark, writing about Dean Chavez, that is such a responsibility that I spend an inordinate amount of time, I think, you know, rewriting and going back and would they really say this or this is, you know, and, and Clark is older now. He's much older than any, where the, you know, any books that Clancy himself wrote. And so I, as a grandfather myself, I, I, you know, I might have Clark tear up not having to whack a bad guy but about his grandkids or just the life and um, that he's watching them lead and how he's sort of at his twilight of his action career you know so i, I spent a lot of time doing that where with the arliss cutters particularly that's my life and so i can go i mean i i wouldn't say i'm arliss at all and if you read the books he's, his grandfather is in a lot of flashbacks and he calls him grumpy because he couldn't say grandpa when he was a little boy and the grandfather raised Arliss and his brother Ethan, who's in the book. Ethan's passed away before the series even starts. Uh, accident up on the North Slope that might or might not be a murder. And so um, there's a lot of flashbacks about Grumpy. They quote a lot of Grumpy rules, these man rules to help him them be good men as they grow up. But if I'm anybody in the books, I'm I'm Grumpy. I mean, he's so I base myself on. I mean, I base. I shouldn't say that I his character is inspired by my own grandfather, my own grandmother. and But those are easier. They're still not what I would say easy to write, but I think the the characters are more, well, the research, much of the research is already done from being out in Bush, Alaska and living in Alaska for 25 years and knowing so many Alaskans for friends, you know, they're my friends. Right. You feel more of a, a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the Clancy's are, they're a, it's a, it's a great honor to have been able to write them and, and, uh, to be able to attach my name in tiny font down at the bottom of the books and, and just know that I get to have some say in what John Clark does and Jack Ryan does. and But uh, they're definitely a responsibility. I would imagine a lot of pressure um, living up to that, uh, you know, years of fans. Well, in readership, yeah, in readership, Tom Clancy readership is, I, I, uh, I'm only half joking when I say it. Most Clancy readers read with a slide rule and a TI-80 graphing ca- calculator by the book so they can check every little thing that I write um, because they want it to be, you know, if I write about a, a particular rock in Kazakhstan, they better be able to find it on Google Maps. You know, that's just a, a Clancy reader. Or they'll come after you. Yeah, yeah, if I, I have standing order with my wife to sound the alarm if some people show up and with baseball bats at the house and come to break my leg. He's that black belt. That black yeah, belt. exactly. Exactly. Uh, you, you mentioned um, in the new book you, you, you've involved the Russia, Russian mafia and stuff. Is, is that a realistic problem in Alaska? Oh, yeah. We're very, we're very to, not to get political, but we, we can't see Russia from our house, but we can sure feel it. And uh, when you get out into Bush, Alaska, um, you know, r- Russian – um, culture is very prevalent and almost every village has some kind of Russian dome church and uh, they're uh, Russian Orthodox and 
um, you see, you know, you hear stories of, uh, I have a friend with, um, <clears throat> uh, fish and wildlife state, you know, state fish and wildlife, um, that has had a couple of interactions with oligarchs that have come across to fish or hunt bear, you know, just flown across the Bering Sea in their helicopters and camped out for a while and then zoomed away. And, um, so they're, you know, I wouldn't say we have like Bratva roaming the streets of Anchorage in great herds, but, uh, it's, it wouldn't be unheard of to have this kind of a thing happen. And, and in this, in this particular book in Breakneck, there's a, some action that happens with the old believers, um, down by, um, down by Homer, actually above Homer on the, on the cliffs there. And that, those are real towns that have the, the people that were basically banished or fled Russia back during some religious purges and a uh, real, you know, reorganization of the Russian Orthodox Church and from, with some different dogma things that they didn't agree with and some of them were martyred. And anyway, some of them, they ran to China for a while and then Oregon and then they fled to Alaska. And so there's a, a very old, they call themselves the old believers. So, and it's interesting. I've been up there for work a couple of times and, um, you know, as a deputy marshal and it's a, it's a very closed society, not, not unfriendly, but very closed. And so if you, if you're looking for somebody to serve a piece of paper to, you know, a summons or whatnot, there, there nobody's going to tell you <laughs> where they are because, you know, there's uncle, brother, sister, whatever. So it's very interesting, very interesting culture to still speak a Slavic, very old, old, old Slavic language. Who's worse, the Russian or the uh, Canadian mob? <laughs> I'm not going to answer that. My wife's Canadian, so. <laughs> so is Al. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so am I. I'm a Canuck. They're everywhere. Yeah, they're everywhere. Yeah. Is there a Canadian mob, or do you guys just apologize? Well, that's the mob. To, we it, go around saying sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, exactly. That's a, that's what my kids do to, to pick it. Their mother, they say, sorry, Mom, what's this all about? <laughs> Well, if somebody reads the, the, uh, the artist books, actually all your books, I, I hate that I told you we weren't going to ask this question. I'm sure you've been asked the million times before, but Alaska. Alaska is a character in the book. That's important to you and it's important to your book. Can you, can you explain that and how you do it and why? No, sure. It's just such a big place that it gives me a, a big, um, it gives me a really broad brush, a broad canvas to paint with. So, you know, Alaska has. We've lived there 25 years now, and I, I've been fortunate enough to, to travel a lot with work with, as a deputy marshal. And then, and then later, the year that I retired to right full time, the troopers hired me for about four months to, to go out and teach some little, like many youth academies, like many public safety academies to students for a week. So I traveled around doing that. And then my wife and I have gone up and down the Kobuk River, which is up on the north, the southern part of the North Slope, uh, teaching literacy to kids in schools. And, and these are all very small villages. They might have like 60 people in a school, um, from kindergarten to not even that many, 25 people in a school from kindergarten through 12th grade. And then others might have 60 or 70 people. But even so, as much travel as I've done, there is a ton of the state that I haven't seen and, and more that my wife hasn't seen. You've got all the way up to Utkiagvik, which is mentioned in this book, which most people know that is Barrow uh, or Point Barrow, the northernmost city in the United States. But it's been renamed uh, Utkiagvik, which is the, the native name for it, what it's been named really forever. So there's all that and they get, you know, that, that 30 days of night show, the vampire show there, that, that, that's that area. So they have complete darkness during the winter and then complete daylight for several months in the summer. So you got all that going on. And Western Alaska is very much, you know, the seal hunting and, and walrus hunting and salmon fishing for subsistence and people that live on the rivers and do, uh, and, and then Southeast Alaska with totem poles and, and, uh, big lodge houses. And, and then of course the Aleutians. There's just so much to write about as far as the culture and the geography and the weather that it, it would be, I, there's no way that I could write a mystery and not, or a thriller and not have the weather be involved. In fact, my editor was a, a couple of books ago. He says, yeah, I see you've got another storm coming in. You want to, you want to, should we write something different? And I said, you know, you might say, Oh, this is a horrible storm coming in. We just call that Tuesday here. It's just, it's just the way it is. And I, I been out to villages before where, one of the, in fact, Stone Cross, the second in this uh, Arliss Cutter series, takes place in a fictional village of Stone Cross, but it's inspired by a couple of actual villages that I did work in 
on the Kuskokwim River. And the Kuskokwim River is like the ice road trucker show. In the, in the winter, it freezes completely solid. They put out road, you know, speed limit signs and all that. And people ride their snow machines and trucks up and down the river to get to these villages. And then in the summer, they take boats. Well, in breakup, you just can't, you can't take a snow machine. You can't take, we, that's what you guys would call a snowmobile, but we call them snow machines. Um, you can't take a snow machine. You can't take a boat because there's big chunks of ice floating in the water and it'll grind you to bits. Um, can't take four wheelers because everything's mushy, you know, mar, marshy and tundra and all that alongside the river. So the only way you can get there is by airplane and then, you know, bush plane. And if the fog rolls in, then the only, well, you can't get there. And so I've talked to 20 year old public health aides that have done operations on people on the, the cafeteria table to save their lives talking via video conference to a doctor in Anchorage. These are people that just, there's a lot of things they wish were a certain way, but they just, this is the way we got to do it. So this is the way we're going to do it. And it's just amazing culture and people. So I have to write that stuff. It, it just wouldn't be, I, I'm not contriving any of it. All, all that stuff is, um, is real. So when you uh, write one of these books and someone takes it home and reads it, um, is this pure entertainment or is there some sort of a meaning or a subtext that you hope the reader will take away from the book? That's a really good question. I, I hope that it's entertaining, but I, I'm not trying to ram any politics or any morality play or anything like that, but I but I hope they learn something from the, the characters. I mean, I see Arliss Cutter. Remember the Marty Robbins song, Big Iron oh, on yeah, His Hip? Yeah. Remember that song? Well, that's who Arliss is. He's the deputy U.S. Marshal, you know, Arizona Ranger that rides into town to face the bad guys. And and he's got a certain code that he lives by. And, and that code, because of some things that happen in his past that you don't find out about until Stone Cross, because of, because of that, he is unwavering. And in a world where there's, you know, relative truth and uh, all kinds of stuff like that now, an unwavering person stands out. And, you know, it, it, there, there's a sort of a thing that runs through these, is, especially with so much, so much talk about, you know, police over, um, you know, being overly violent or, or, or uh, police brutality or, or all of that, which, which happens. I'm a 30 year, 29 year law enforcement veteran, and I admit that it happens. Uh, I don't think it happens as often as, as we, we see portrayed because that work is violent. And it's a recurring theme in these books where Lola will think, Oh my gosh, Cutter's lost his crap here. He's going crazy. And, and he says, look, I could have shot this guy. I did not. The two by four was handy. And so I smacked him in the head with it. It looks violent to people around us, but what's worse, shooting him in the eye. So it, it, he's a, he's just, I want to make a kind of a person that I want to write about the kind of a person that is unwavering in his morality and unwavering in his uh, actions towards evil. And I, I have, as far as teaching the reader, I, um, and, and the way he treats women and young people and, the, and weaker people as far as, you know, when a bully is after somebody that's not a six foot two, 230 pound brawler like he is. He's learned from his, because he wasn't always big. He was a little runt in school and he still was the same way when you look back at the flashbacks in the books. And so he learned from his grandfather and his older brother, this is the way to be. And so through the grumpy rules, through hopefully, you know, showing, not telling, I, I hope I at least teach young people, young men, how to be good men and, and, um, uh, young people how to be good people right right well and sometimes things will come up organically um some sort of a theme or a meaning that you didn't sit out to write it just happened and i hope that's the way it works i hope it's organic i i think if there was any other theme it's what i've said a couple of times in this show is that i that we really have to see things as they are not as we wish they were well but that 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 also brings up because you are writing fiction rather than nonfiction, kind of the advantages is you can make things happen or end more the way you want them to. Sure. And when I say things as they are, rather than the way I wish they were, I mean life itself, evil people. Why, you know, I don't think I've ever had a 
victim in some case that I was working that didn't say, why did this happen to me? I don't know why, but it, but it did. And I've heard particularly one, one of those particularly evil people that I, one of the ones that I would classify as, as evil if I'm, you know, I'm probably not in the, the shoes to judge that, but he sure seemed evil to me. He, uh, I remember an FBI agent was asking him, and this guy was a serial killer, and an FBI agent asked him why. He was a younger FBI agent, and the bad guy was sort of recounting what he had done to this victim. And it just astounded this young FBI agent. It just kind of, you could see, it was just mouth agape. And he, without even thinking about it, he said, why? You know, he was just kind of traumatized. And the bad guy looked at him and kind of smiled, and he said, that's the difference in me and you. You say, why? I say, why not? And I thought, okay, that's that's an evil guy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to internalize a little bit of that and write it someday. But I think that writing, so if I write that truthfully, okay, yeah, he's going to get caught in my books because I can, I can uh, make the end happen, right? But certainly I, in a perfect world, he wouldn't commit any of that mayhem. And I have to be truthful about that, that he is an evil man and he's not going to let everybody slide until the police catch him. Did you ever think about uh, stepping back from the thriller, this kind of thriller genre and maybe write something else? Kill a Mockingbird and you fly? Yeah, no, I think I have a couple of uh, YA ideas I'd like to do, but they're thrillers. I mean, I think life is thrilling and life told truthfully. I mean, my daughter-in-law is a, you know, Bronte sister is kind of re- reader, and I think she wants me to write a romance, and uh, there's no way. I, I, I think there's romance in my books, real-life romance, but I I don't generally, when I'm thinking of writing, I would say when I'm opening the book, I think, okay, this is a thriller. I've got to start this a certain way. Like my editor says um, on the Cutters and on the Quinn, start with a massacre and build from there, right? So I think, okay, there's a thriller. In fact, my my youngest son, when he was reading the second Jericho Quinn book, he um, wrote me a letter. It's called Act of Terror. And he wrote a, wrote me a letter after he read it. He was away at college. And he said, Dad, I hope that someday I can wheelie a Royal Enfield motorcycle into oncoming gunfire to save the girl. And I thought, well, that really typifies my writing style, I guess. That's what I want to get across in these books. But at the same time, I don't think I don't set out to write a thriller. I set out to write a story that I think is real for these characters and they're action people. So hopefully it becomes thrilling, but um, I let the bookstores and the, you know, the publisher decide what genre it's in. You sound very um, close to your character artist. Like it, it sounds like, uh, how do you, let's just say this. How do you describe your relationship with artists? Oh, well, you never asked me that before. I, I don't know. You're on NBC. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I look up to him. I think Arliss is an amalgam of all the the great men that I've met and have been and women that I've met over the years, the law enforcement folks, my you know, um that I've been able to work with over the years in the military and law enforcement and I've molded them together and he's he's stoic. He's he's uh, doesn't smile very much. So I guess I do share that with him. I'm not a big smiler. He's a tracker. He, he does all the things I wish I could do well. I do, you know, I, I am a tracker. I was a tracker for the Marshal Service. I do consider myself an outdoorsman. Uh, I do certainly love my grandkids. And so I spent, you know, spend time cooking with them and he spends time cooking with his nephews, but I'm not, I'm not him. And I don't, you know, I don't try to channel myself through him. If anything, I try to channel the wisdom from my own grandfather through him so that someday when my grandkids are old enough to read this kind of book, then they'll they'll maybe learn a bit about how to chase bad guys and track fugitives through the woods or track anybody and cook creamy scrambled eggs or make uh, French onion soup or whatever else Arliss does in the books. See, that's why I say there's a, there's a, there's a theme that is the current is a family. You got that family relationship thing running through all your books. Yeah, I, th- that. I think that comes out, and that's almost the glue that kind of holds all the other stuff kind of together. Is that humanity, family relationship? Piece. Well, I think that's that's. I'm glad you say that because so. And, I, and again, people write different kind of characters, and that's great. They do well. For me, having spent this much time in law enforcement, 
Sure. Of course there were divorced people and people with, you know, broken marriages and alcohol problems and PTSD and trauma. And, and those were real, true issues that, that my f good friends of mine have. And so I, I don't in, in any way mean to make light of them. But when I'm writing a character, I, I want to point out that there's a heck of a lot of happily married cops as well. <laughs> and, and they don't go from, you know, from port to port with the, you know, a new girl in every city and, and, uh, you can be a, you can be a, a family person and still solve crime and still chase bad guys. Now, now, now Arliss does have, because he and Mim haven't gotten together yet, um, or I guess they, we're trying to see if that's going to happen. His sister-in-law, um, who's widowed and he's had a crush on since they were 16. Um, there is that, issue that he plays with, but he's also, he's been married four times and had a wife die of cancer. And so he's dealing with some relationship issues along the way. And so he'll have girls that look at him and I just want to make him real. But I also, at the end of the day, he just wants a family. And so many of my friends, that's what, and I've been very fortunate, been married to the same woman for 39 years and, um, She's supported me in my writing and my law enforcement career. And uh, in fact, just a really quick aside as far as the law enforcement wife goes, I think we don't oftentimes we don't give enough enough kudos to law enforcement spouses and what they have to go through. But when our young our youngest was out of the academy, spent almost a year or half a year on the field training, so he always had that person with him. So he's on his own for the first time by himself on midnight shift, and he's our baby. You know, I mean. He's, 24, 25 at the time, 24. And, um, but he's our baby. And, and I feel a certain amount of guilt for even getting him, you know, for answering his questions and getting involved in law enforcement. My gosh, if something ever happened to me, it would be horrible. Or happened to him, it would be horrible. And so that night, he's on his own. Midnights, I'm beside myself. I just can't even, I can't sit down. I'm so nervous about our, my, you know, my young son out there by himself on the mean streets. And I looked at my wife, and she was fine. She was absolutely fine, just calm as a summer morn. And I, I just said, Vicky, what is the matter with you? How can Dan's out there by himself? What? How could you be so calm? And she looked at me, and she said, Mark, this is new to you. I've been feeling this way for 30 years. And it really it really struck me what she's had to deal with for the, you know, the late-night hospital calls and, and, you know, come pick me up. I've been dragged by a car or, whatever that I just, or the, you know, me calling and telling her, Oh man, we had a, we had a witness shot in the eye. And so we're having to run code and move people by helicopter. And this is so fun. And all she's hearing is there's gunfire and you're in it. Um, and so I, I really did a little re rejigger in the way I thought and try to bring that across in the books too. This, uh, this is not just, a, it's not just all action. There's some trauma that happens on the home front as well. And in a way, in a way, that's probably how you keep it fresh. I hope so. I hope so. That sort of uh, family and uh, growth within it and moving on. How do you, how do you think each book changes you? These are really good questions. I, you know, I, I think I grow every time just by watching, watching the characters, watching the way they interact. And, and, you know, I learn from the, the research as well and talking to the, the wise people that, uh, that I can sit and chat with and, you know, run my ideas by them. What do you think about this? And so I, I learn something every single time. And I'm very fortunate that our, our youngest is a, a member of a, a really, really good, uh, highly trained SWAT team and with Anchorage. And so I'm able to go and go to their training and I just sit there and listen. And I, sometimes I'll, you know, I stand with the role players with a yellow vest on and just listen to these young guys. It, it really um, does my heart good to see what good quality folks are are out there on the front lines now, because there is a certain a certain way of thinking in the zeitgeist right now about police officers, and you know why. And in fact, even among I'm on a couple of mess, you know, <laughs> I dated myself saying message boards, but a couple of social media pages. Uh, I, I was incidentally never on Here a message pitching. board. Um, but, but, uh, yeah, exactly. But, uh, I, on a couple of social media pages with retired deputy marshals and other retired folks. And 
there's just a lot of why would anybody do this now? Why would you face? Well, I would do it again because I would do it again it, because I see law enforcement as a calling. And many, many times I'll have people at a book event or, you know, or my publisher or somebody will say, man, this is, you're doing well. This is, you know, this, this is, this is your dream come true. This is the best job in the world. And yes, this being a novelist full time doing arguably, you know, some success. Yes, it is a incredible job and I feel very fortunate, but I already had my dream job. I already had the best job in the world to me. Being, a, I miss being a deputy U.S. marshal every day. I miss the people. I don't miss the politics very much, but I, but I do miss the the mission and I miss the people. So that was my dream job. Being a, a full time novelist, that's the second best job yeah, in the world. I think I'm, um, I'm happy to have. It. I think there are a lot of differences that 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 are around in in the country, like thoughts on police and stuff. A lot of it is because um, you you don't know what it's like to be there you know, if you haven't done it. And I think that's sort of mm-hmm. um, something a lot of people forget. No, that's very true. It is. A, it can be a violent job. And we as a, as a, that blue line could, could do a better job of getting, uh, you know, being, because you do have a tendency to be, to seem and even be a bit cynical. My wife cut a, remember that cartoon Ziggy, the little short bald dude and the Car, uh, the Sunday paper. Call it Alley. Yeah, call it Alley. Years ago. You know, me too. You haven't seen my picture. I, I'm Ziggy with a beard. But the, the, um, little short guy with a beard and a big nose. Anyway, there's a Ziggy cartoon and it shows him on the side of the street and this police car rides by and they're both glaring at him. And on the side of the car, it says, we're cops and you're not. And I don't know if, if she gave it to me as a warning or, or what, but it was, it, we, do have a tendency to be a bit insular. And, you know, I've been to several trainings for leadership trainings and to their credit, the leadership schools won't let two law enforcement officers go at the same time because they know we would bond together and and not talk to anyone else because, you know, they don't understand what we have to go through. And I think we would be better served. And I think some departments are really doing, I know Anchorage does this and some departments are learning that, we would all be better served if we, and I'm not talking about touchy feely outreach, but some sort of turning outbound and saying, here's a, uh, we're people. We got our kids in school. You know, we have hopes and dreams and like to ski or hunt or fish or snow machine or whatever, like the rest of you. And, um, I think it would help sort of bridge that gap a little bit because we need law enforcement. And again, like I said, I, I would do it over again in a heartbeat, and I'm, I'm proud of my well, you kids for we'll hire you. We're doing it as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little long in the tooth for it now, and I get I get what's that Toby Keith song? I'm as good once as I ever was, but after one night, I would be pee and blood and and traction and all that stuff. So, do you ever get surprised with what some of the readers pick out in your book at times or spot? Well, uh, yeah, I, last night at an event in uh, Riverton, a lady said that the, she was reading. Um, <laughs> right neck and she said it made her hungry <laughs> said, okay. that's uh that's surprising to me yeah but uh you know people have their little little bits and pieces of things that they like little turn of a phrase of a character they like i don't i don't um i don't read my own reviews very often at all uh but i i'm glad to get reviews so people have to email me or or come to the event to to really get you know to interact with me that way and i'm happy to have that happen um but by the time, by the time a book comes out, some, some people, sometimes people will ask me, and you guys have probably had this same phenomenon. I'll be out talking about a book in an event and they'll ask me about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm already two books down the road and I'm trying to remember what, you know, and one, one lady said, well, tell me about so and so, so and so. And I'm like, how do you, <laughs> I'm not sure you read the right book. Maybe you're talking about somebody else's book. She goes, no, it's, it's the guy that came out of the woods and he's a hermit. And I said, we have that guy. Oh, I, I couldn't remember what his name was. Tom. Yeah. yeah, that's him. Um, so oftentimes people will glom onto a character that they really like that I, that I liked when I wrote him or her at the time, but they didn't really register as deeply with me as they do with the, that particular reader. And that's good. I, I find it a backhanded compliment when somebody says, man, I wish I could have known more about this particular so-and-so character. There's a character at the very beginning of the very first Jericho Quinn book. It's a um, 
a police officer that's overlooking a mall um, in a fictional town that's kind of inspired by Castle Rock, Colorado. So it's a, he's looking over the town and the the mall, and there's a big terrorist bombing that happens in this mall and his wife and kid are there. And so he's watching this. And so the, the bombing happens from his point of view. And it's the whole first chapter, first two chapters of the book. And he's a, he's a very interesting character in my mind. And, you know, and I did some description of, because I wanted to see, I wanted to show this, this horrific event that happens that precipitates the whole rest of the book. Uh, and people are, I've, I've gotten quite a few emails like, well, what happened to, to so-and-so? What, what, you know, I, I, I want to know more about him. Well, what happened is he was traumatized and, you know, A, B, and C happened that you see in the book and, and the rest of it goes from there. We don't get to know about everyone. That's, that's life. But a lot of people, I, I learned, I, I did learn that I need to maybe put a sentence or two <laughs> to, to let people know whether he lived or died kind of a thing. So I learned as I went. But the, I thought that was apparent, but evidently it wasn't. But that was, you know, 14 books ago. Well, let's talk about uh, your tour and where you're going to be. Uh, you're going to be in Salt Lake, and I know we air there. So let's talk about what you're doing in Utah. Yeah, so on the 10th at, uh, I think, 6 o'clock, we'll be at the Provo uh, City Library. And King's English Books from Salt Lake is going to be down in Provo handling book sales. But I'll be doing a little uh, chat there. I'll try not to tell any of these same stories. But uh, I, I tell, I joke with my friends that are in, in your line of work that do interviews and podcasts that if you have a guy like me on and they tell, or a friend that was in law enforcement or the military, and they tell you more than nine war stories, then they're lying. They're, or, or stealing somebody else's war stories. So I'll try to switch a room around. But yeah, so we'll be at the Provo City Library on the 10th and, um, it should be a good time. Well, fantastic. And you have a website, you do show, social media. Where do people find Mark? Yeah, if you were just Google Mark Cameron or Mark Cameron Books, sadly my ugly mug is all over it. And I need to actually put some more on there now that I don't have hair because I'm a tiny bit prettier in my old pictures. But uh, when I had hair and I had not a gray beard. But um, now I'm uh, Mark Cameron Books is my website or Mark Cameron one on Instagram and just Mark Cameron author on Facebook. And I, I'm uh, more active than I want to be, but I, but I do, uh, I like interacting with readers, but mostly if people go on there, they won't see it too much about my books, except when I'm on tour, they'll see more about Alaska and my adventures, you know, ATV and with my wife or my grandkids or whatever. Of course, we'll have that up as well as your book. Good luck in utah and uh and with the book thank you so much for having me on this has been fun okay and now the book is called breakneck captivating novel of suspense an arliss cutter novel book five mr mark cameron thank you for being here hey thanks bye mike you've been listening to the house of mystery radio show to find out more about our guests hosts or shows go to www.com houseofmystery.com Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.